Are you ready to make the most of your oil and gas mineral rights? Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Get the knowledge and resources you need to manage your minerals and royalties. Here is your host, Matt Sands. Hello and welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Sands, and I'm here to help you make the most of your minerals and royalties. We've talked a lot on this show before about how mineral buyers underwrite deals and what their thoughts are on the market. For example, one of our most popular episodes was our conversation with my good friend Will Cullen with Long Point Minerals in episode 45 of the Mineral Rights Podcast. Will revealed a behind-the-scenes look at how companies evaluate mineral deals. But today, I'm extremely excited to welcome on the show Tim Powell with the Oil and Gas Council and the host of the Minerals and Royalties podcast. Tim is very tied into the minerals and royalties market through his interactions with leaders of mineral companies, both big and small. This conversation was really interesting as Tim gives an overview of the conversations he's having with these senior leaders and what they are thinking about the minerals market following the oil war in and in a post-COVID world from how they've changed the way they underwrite deals given the uncertainties in the market right now to the types of deals that are still closing and where he sees the biggest opportunities. Tim grew up in Long Island, New York, and was recruited down to Rice University to play golf. Upon graduation in 2011, Tim earned a BA in economics and political science. From 2011 to 2014, Tim ran the International Division of PLS, Inc., where he focused on business development in upstream oil and gas space. He later transitioned into a corporate development role at Oil and Gas Council, where he works today as the Senior Vice President of the Americas, overlooking Oil and Gas Council's portfolio in Canada, U.S., Mexico, and South America. In Tim's role with Oil and Gas Council, he's focused on facilitating introductions on behalf of investors and oil and gas executives in order to help place capital, buy, sell deals, and form new partnerships. So without further ado, please welcome Tim Powell with the Minerals and Royalties Podcast and the Oil and Gas Council. Hi, Tim. Uh, Welcome to the Mineral Rights Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So uh, I've been looking forward to the interview here and to learning a little bit more about your background, but just to dive in, let's start with a question we ask all of our guests. Can you please tell our listeners about your background and how you got into minerals and royalties? Absolutely. So it's a bit of an indirect back into the space. Well, I don't run a minerals company, so coming from a different angle, but I uh, started in the mineral space a little bit in the beginning of my career and then kind of revisit about three, four years later. So taking a step back, went to Rice University down in Houston and was uh, an analyst at a merchant bank called Corporate Finance Associates my senior year. Um, they did turnarounds and, and mergers and corporate advisory work like that for the lower to mid market. And the, the goal was to go to a big bracket bank and, and be a financial analyst. Uh, the way the chips fell in terms of graduate and get my first job. Uh, I ended up getting into a a firm called PLS. A buddy of mine worked there and was able to help get me an interview and and the the ultimate job. And leveraging my experience at Corporate Finance Associates, they had a brokerage arm that focused on low to mid-market divestment opportunities within the oil and gas space. So I wasn't specifically looking for oil and gas, but that was kind of the match and how I was hired. And when I started I was handling small minerals packages from a brokerage standpoint. So half a million bucks, a couple million bucks, and kind of cut my teeth on the the industry from the minerals lens and understood the dynamics and who some of the major players were at that time. This is 2011. So very much a, a different looking space than it is today. And then, you know, when I was at PLS, started doing something a bit different several months into the job. Uh, I was still doing minerals packages for about a year, but I, I took over their international division and I traveled a bunch and helped launch a, a new product line for them more on the, the data M&A analytics side. The real reason for me volunteering for that was 
getting out, seeing the world, traveling, and it was a great opportunity for me personally. Now, when I was traveling a lot, I did all the business development on the back of oil and gas councils conferences in London, in Hong Kong, in, in Paris, covering Africa. And that's the company I work for today. So I developed a very strong personal relationship with the founders and the employees of that firm. And fast forward three years later, I had phoned one of the partners who was running the Americas division at the time and said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of making a transition. I really like your company and your team. We all know each other personally. Would you ever see an opportunity for me to join? And just so happened a spot was opening in their Americas group. And that's almost seven years ago now, and I'm, I'm running the Americas division. And when when I joined was 2014, it was the, the first event that I was involved in was our North America Assembly out of Houston. And this was right after Viper and Prairie Sky went public. And so I had, you know, going back three years, I'd remembered this little mom and pop shop game in the mineral space, at least that's how I understood it as. And now I'm seeing these large scale IPOs, right? And that caught my attention. And I said, well, that that's totally different than from what I remember. And just the value that was created by spinning these assets out of the balance sheet, they weren't getting the same multiples baked into the EMP companies. They were standalone. So I just said to my team, hey, there, there's something here. I know this space and this is possibly a new trend. Let's start blending into our conferences. And that was 2014. You fast forward to today, it's obviously gotten to be a way more developed space. Lots of institutional capital and private equity funds have entered. The scale of dollars is massively different than it was. There's way more competition, way more technology, way more sophistication. And we've kind of rode that wave. And we now have a minerals and royalties conference called the North Dam Royalties Assembly in Houston. Every October, we do a, a finance-focused conference on minerals with the New York Stock Exchange in New York every June. And then we host a series of CEO minerals dinners. We have a, a minerals webinar series. We have a minerals podcast. We partner with Probus Energy Services to put out pulse reports, which are, have a lot of minerals analytical data. So we're, we're quite active in the space and have some great relationships. And it's been fun to, to see it evolve over, over time. That sounds like an interesting journey along the way. And, and like you've mentioned, the minerals space certainly has changed a lot over the past five years or so. You mentioned the Oil and Gas Council seems to be active in that space, but just maybe taking a step back to help provide some context as to the, the mission of the organization. So you mentioned a little bit about you, you guys host conferences for oil and gas and sort of what, what is the objective and kind of who are the attendees of these conferences? Can you talk a little bit about what those look like? Yeah, no, I appreciate the question. Really the takeaway I'd love people to have on oil and gas council. If you go to our website, it, it looks like a conference company, but we do run conferences. Our PNL largely sits around events, but the main value of the business is relationship brokering and making informal connections, helping vet introductions and expedite the BD process. At its core, that's what we do. And that's why we've been able to function in a COVID world where there's no events because we're still delivering that. And then when you back that into the mineral space, it's just a an aspect of what we do. It's something that I enjoy. It's something that is a bright spot in the industry right now. So it's getting a lot of attention from our team and me in particular. But you know, we, we have offices in Beijing, in Singapore, in London, in Cape Town, South Africa, I run our Americas group out of Houston, and we cover the full value chain, including energy and renewables and emerging markets. So very, we have a very broad mandate, and we cover a lot of things. And we work primarily with management teams, uh, small to mid-cap space. And then you know, when you get to larger companies, your regional leadership, your country-level leadership, when you look at international markets, that's our core clientele. And then anyone and everyone who invests in oil and gas projects or teams from a debt or equity perspective, your family offices, your private equity funds, pensions to a certain extent that go direct, that that's credit funds. Those are very much a good, a large part of our network as well. We just try to get an understanding of everyone's strategy, their investment criteria, their regions of focus, their development pipelines, their M&A pipelines. And, you know, on the sell side, if it's a tech firm or a services firm, who their ideal client is and what their strategic initiatives are for growth. And we've traditionally used events to then have everyone captive, you know, captive audience for a day or two to facilitate introductions. And we do that tying in all the knowledge we accrue throughout the year. And 
the dinners we host, the receptions we host, the conferences we host, private meetings, the webinars, the podcasts, all that helps us build up that pool of intel and the relationships that enable us to execute those introductions. So that's really the core of it. You know, when you see everything we're doing, everything it has a long tail goal of building a relationship, getting the trust to a point where we can start to really look under the hood of a business and and help connect you with folks that can help you from a capital perspective or, or a BD commercial perspective. Got it. Now, that sounds like that relationship making is a key part. And, and I can imagine that you've met some interesting people along the way. Can you talk a little bit about some of those relationships that, that you've built and some of the people that you've met through that process? Yeah, that's that's the funnest part of the job. I, I like to think of myself as somewhat intelligent, but the people I interact with on a day to day basis are the smartest minds in the world, right? Uh, of finance and oil and gas. And so, when, when all you do is is sit down and get into the headspace of a CEO of of a company or the head of a private equity firm, that that that's quite exciting. And you really get to see at a macro level the trends of where the space is going and who's doing what, you see who's innovating and how they're doing that. And it's really cool. And, and you you kind of piece it all together. And what, what I typically do, let's just say I'm going to Midland or Denver for some meetings. I'll have 30 meetings in a week and you very quickly can start to bounce questions off of people based on feedback and comments you've heard in other meetings. And you do it discreetly, you don't mention names, but you're able to, to use everyone's perspectives against each other to, to really get some thoughtful and engaging conversations. And that's very much how we build our relationships and, and rapport uh, because we're so plugged in on, on what everyone's doing. And to, to just keep it simple, because we do work all over the world and in, in all different verticals of this oil and gas space, keeping it simple for minerals, since this is a minerals podcast, we speak with the private equity sponsors. We speak with the portfolio companies that they back in, in all the various basins, the pension back companies, the family office back shops, the aggregators that self fund and bootstrap their funds and anyone, you know, in between that spectrum, Appalachia to the Rockies, to the Permian, to the end of Darko, Barnett, Eagleford, Haynesville. Since March in particular, I kind of took a step back when the oil price war hit the market and COVID the market at the same time. And I said, okay, there's, there aren't going to be a lot of events or travel happening for a while. There's a lot of restructuring. There's going to be a total reset in the market with layoffs and CapEx cuts and OpEx cuts and strategies being retooled from you know a drilling perspective. Where is my time going to be best spent? And the answer to that was the mineral space. I just felt like the dynamics of the mineral space made, made it um, a worthwhile exercise to call folks and, and really kind of dive in deeper. You know, one... The, you know, if you had dry powder, it was an incredible opportunity, theoretically, to buy minerals, right? Uh, March onwards, you have distressed uh, sellers of, of mineral assets, not only because their income stream has re been reduced because of the oil price drop, but also just the stress on the, the economy with, with COVID. And so that creates a really compelling opportunity to buy valuable assets at a discount. So if you have dry powder, really, really interesting time to to buy minerals. Um, so I understood at a high level and, and was curious to kind of reach out to folks to see where they were at with that. You know, you start to see a bit of a dichotomy in oil versus natural gas strategies or folks kind of retooling the blend of that within their portfolios. So you start seeing uh, firms entering new basins. You know, there's shops that are in between funds and fundraising can be difficult in a time like this. So one that one shot that might be a traditional end buyer might be flipping deals um, using their own money in between. And so just being up to speed on all that, uh, knowing how the pensions are reacting, knowing how the P sponsors are acting um, and, and fitting it all together has been a fun puzzle for us to figure out. And, you know, on the back of the 200 plus calls we've had with mineral CEOs in the last five, six months, it's just piecing that information together. Who has capital who has deal flow, who's entering a new basin to where they may not be as well known and who needs to speak to who to help at facilitate that deal flow uh, at a more fluid rate. And, and that's what we've been trying to do. And, and then, you know, anything in between tech companies that have something really interesting to help on the data edge side or the speed side, you know, people who are looking to 
raise money, if there's new investors looking at the space, kind of matching them up. And, you know, the end goal is to just help help everyone's uh, initiatives out and, and do it in a more productive, efficient way. I think in this environment, the, the challenge is, you know, outside of your immediate circle, you know, folks you can call on their cell phone on a Saturday and you've built that relationship up. You know, outside of that, if you don't have a very specific deal mandate, it's hard to cold call somebody in this environment. And especially in the mineral space, there's a lot of private emails or people who only operate on a cell phone. So without that prior contact, it can be really difficult to expand your network without NAEP, without, you know, the intercoms and, you know, just recently the Mark event, uh, our events, that soft networking, the deal chatter you pick up, bumping into the guy or the gal, you know, but don't really know, but you you kind of get a download on what they've been doing the last six months. Because we're not all able to do that kind of travel, uh, I've seen a, a real need in the market to get kind of clued into what's going on. And that's that's the role we're trying to fill in this kind of weird intermediary period of, uh, of non-travel and non-face-to-face meetings, right? That definitely is a, a huge need. And, and is that sort of the impetus for starting the Minerals and Royalties podcast? Or can you talk a little bit more about the decision to, uh, to start the show? Yeah, so I think similar to, to you, Matt, I, I'm a big podcast consumer. I think for years, you know, I, I live in Katy, Texas, which is a suburb of Houston. So it's a good 40, 50 minutes downtown for meetings. I, I like working from home, but spend usually half my time out of the office in a pre-COVID world doing BD meetings. So when you add that up, that's an hour and a half commuting in the car. And uh, what do you fill that up with? Uh, some really good quality podcast content, right? And so I have my different channels that I like, and there's different styles and different levels of entertainment that come with that. And you know, you enjoy it, and then you think to yourself, now nah, I, w- I would love to do this uh, and have my own blended style of all the things that I find uh, really really good from the podcast I listen to, but what am I going to do it on? And it was always, we're so busy and don't just do it for, you know, the sake of doing a podcast or creating content. It always kind of fell by the wayside because we didn't really know how to define that. But then the light bulb went off. This is probably January of this year. The question we always ask clients is who can we introduce you to? What's the best way for us to add value? Let us know how we can connect the dots what's your strategy, so on and so forth, right? We're always asking this question. And the, the answer we get more times than not from minerals companies is, if you really want to help us, Tim, you know, let us know of any new end buyers out there, foundations, insurance companies, any large institutional players that want to own you know, yield generating assets in their portfolio. This is a great asset class. And we have some great turnkey assets that we've built up. They would be a great exit for us. If you know of anyone like that, let us know. Or, you know, hey, Tim, I'm, I'm raising a new $15 million fund. If you know of any accredited investors or high net worth individuals or IRAs or wealth managers or family offices, we'd love to get in touch with them. The more non-industry, the better, right? We can educate them and uh, we'd love to get them in our fund. We're getting great returns. Listen, everyone's looking for that. I think that's the golden goose. I, I think it's a collaborative effort between conferences, between every CEO that runs a minerals company. Uh, between the, you know a lot of the the banks that are doing incredible advisory work, you know identifying buy side targets and running the data rooms, everyone's trying to identify who these players are. From our perspective, we have this great events platform, and we could you know throughout the year we do one every six months, slowly but surely start to get endowments and different types of these end buyers and investors into our events. But it was a slow burn, and after a year of doing that. Uh, you know, manually researching out who these firms might be and kind of cold calling them and inviting them to our events. I just said, this isn't moving the needle enough. This isn't adding enough value. And uh, I said, you know, even if I were to theoretically get the interest of an asset manager or a family office, someone who is managing hundreds of millions or billions of dollars and minerals and royalties might be 5% of that. How am I really going to get their attention or explain the asset class in a way that will pique their interest. And just a couple of bullet points on the return profile isn't going to do it. Um, And that's where the idea for the podcast came up. I said, you know what? No one really cares what we have to say, but the CEOs that are running this industry, there should be interest there. And we have all those relationships already. 
let's put a podcast together and have some regular content and create a library of information on the mineral space that's readily accessible for anyone who's interested. So if you're an investor and your interest is peaked, you want to do your homework, what do you do now? You Google, you know, minerals and royalties and it just, the results are not great, right? There's not a lot out there. It's been largely a privately held space for a long time and private companies are private for a reason. They don't have to disclose a whole bunch. You get certain companies disclose more than others from deal flow perspective or blogs or whatever have you, but there's five or six public companies. And so you can look at our presentations, but that's only one sliver of the minerals universe. They have certain behaviors that they have to follow because they're public and they're, they're paying distributions and they need largely cash generating assets. They need a certain scale um, for it to be accretive. And so there's just so many other parts of the space that are important to understand. And so I knew you can't just rely on an IR deck. Let's, let's just get all these CEOs on. And that was the concept. And it, it's really taken off. We, we recorded a handful of episodes in February with the plans to launch in March. And then we all know what happened in March. So the timing of COVID and, and the oil price war was really coincidence with the, with the launch of the podcast. But without traveling and everything, it's enabled me to focus on it a lot more. And it's been incredibly well received that, you know, from concept phase to execution, I've been really excited and proud of the team and, and making it to what it is today. And we look forward to continuing it. And, you know, the end goal of getting more folks in our funnel, it's working. We're getting inbounds all the time from minerals companies we've never heard of, investment funds we've never heard of. And clients have said, this has been a great tool for us to use for our own LPs uh, who aren't 100% educated on the space. They found this really helpful. Um, when we go on fundraising and roadshows, uh, we send it ahead of time of our meeting. Just say, hey, listen to this episode on the way to work. It, it, that's been uh, feedback I've heard, which is really cool. And then I think just in general, you know, you, you get to know someone informally in, in the networking environments. But then when you hear the story and the strategy, I think peer to peer, it's been really helpful as well, just to profile what a company's all about and hopefully increase that visibility on how to do business with them. But also we, we do business with people at the end of the day. So someone might have grown up in the same town or you went to the same university or you just kind of jive with their personality after hearing them speak for an hour. If that helps cultivate a new relationship, that's the core of what we do, right? And so this is through a content portal, a great way to initiate that. And I just love the personal touch and feel of the podcast format. It's free flowing. Um, there's really, you know, we write the rules uh, uh, however we see fit, right? Um, Justin, Matt, you guys know that. So I think folks have enjoyed that and it, it's been a blast. Yeah. And I can imagine to your point about living in the post COVID world, you know, there's a lot less traveling going on right now. So I imagine it's easier to schedule guests and get people interested in, in coming on the show just because they don't have that platform to, to get out and meet people and to build those relationships. So we're having to do that a lot more virtually right now. So can you talk about some of the episodes you've produced so far? I mean, how many episodes in are you? And, you know, what are some of the favorite conversations you've had on the show so far? Yeah, so we, I got to look at the total count. I think we're nearing 30 episodes and we've had a really broad spectrum in terms of size. So we've gotten some of the larger players of Long Point, uh, Will Cullen, they're backed by Canadian Pension Plan. Um, I, I just did an episode with Scott Noble, one of the, household names, if you may, in the mineral space since the late 90s. We're going to be posting that here in the next few days. Just did an episode with Mackie Cannon, CEO of One Map Minerals. Uh, Darren Geiger, CEO of Cornerstone. They've been at it since 84. And then, you know, in, in kind of the mid-tier size, um, you know, guys like Nick Verrill at Wing, who sold to Alliance uh, Coal Company. And um, Josh Camp at Perpetual. These are some of the private equity back guys. Um, some of the smaller guys, you know, Mountain Lion Oil and Gas, uh, Charlie Matter, Case Energy Partners, Chris Bentley, uh, Bellator. But we, we've tried to mix it up by Basin as well. You know, Ran Oliver, Viking Minerals is a, an eagle for a guy. Uh, we've had some Anadarko players. Uh, Matt Weischeck of Par City used to be at San Jacinto. They, you know, he's a, a, a million dollar fund focused on Appalachia. So we're, we're covering the spectrum again. We want to 
paint the picture of what the mineral space looks like from the bottom level to the top level, the different costs of capital that play, the different behaviors that they, they put out, the strategies, what their thoughts are based on a basin, how people buy and hold, how they recycle assets and anything in between. So it's been really fun. Some of the episodes I really enjoyed, uh, Darren Geiger's episode was fantastic. I mean, listen, all the episodes have been great in their own right, but Darren Geiger's episode was fantastic. You know, they, they've sold uh, assets one time. They made a large exit actually to Haymaker in 2014 before they sold to Kimball. And they sold it $140 oil. They also strategically hedged um, on the backs of hurricanes when there's price spikes, when natural gas prices went high. They played the cycles in, in a long-term macro perspective. And not too many can speak to that because they've just gotten the game in 2014-15. They have a, a five to seven year fun life. You know, the, the Cornerstone guys have a hedge fund backing them and very much are looking to hold into perpetuity, but just play the large scale macro events to their advantage and hedge, but not too aggressively, you know, on a month to month basis, just when it makes sense to optimize portfolio value. So that was really cool. You know, Will Collin from Long Point's great. I mean, raising close to a couple billion dollars in funds and putting out of work and in a four to five year period, just seeing how they go about doing that. Brandon Algara, the CFO of Echo Energy, another large company, institutionally backed. They do every single thing in house. They don't outsource anything. You got other groups. I did a an episode with Anna May and, and Jackie Haney at Union Rock Partners. They're raising a you know a couple hundred million dollar fund right now. They have three people, so they believe in outsourcing, keeping lean. So you just you see all the different looks and feels of the space. It's it's really cool, and there's there's no right way to make money. Everyone can do it in a different way. And that's the beauty of it. And all sorts of different walks of life, real estate, land, finance, tech, the folks running these shops are all different and doing it in a different way. And uh, it, it's it's been a blast. And I, I look forward to continue doing it. We're just scratching the surface. And you know, as we, we start to get a little more mature as a podcast and having guests on, you'll start you know getting guests on around deal flow activity and certain events in the market. And, and that's kind of how I see it evolving. But for now, it's just really scratching the surface and getting people on for the first time, telling their story. And I'm looking forward to continuing for sure. Yeah. And I've listened to a few of the episodes and there, like you mentioned, there's definitely some, some interesting stories. And, you know, I listened to Jackie and Anna's episode. Jackie is a, and I go way back and actually will as well. And will appeared on our show in episode 45. And so, uh, Anyone listening that hasn't heard that, go back and listen to that. Really interesting to hear how they underwrite deals and, and how they look at properties, both from an investor standpoint, as well as if you're an individual mineral owner, some really good tips in that one. You know, and, and the interesting thing about the mineral space is there's no doubt you, you compete with people on the ground, right? But more times than not, it's it makes more sense to have a, a relationship with folks because of the club deal dynamic. And because of, you know, size of deals can fall on your plate that you can't take down 100%. So you can bring someone in and you can divide it up and go your separate ways, right? And you split the interest accordingly and put it into different partnerships. And you're not really tied at the hip on that. You can just partner on transactions and just sharing deal flow. I mean, everyone's got uh, different types of underwriting criteria. So you know, folks that want to buy more P2P heavy, they might come across a really good undeveloped property and, and flip it to someone who they know buys that. Uh, and there might be a little bit of overlap where you compete in certain sections. But for the most part, I think that's what's really unique about that mineral space. And so just having an idea of, of what everyone's doing is, is important. And you know, I can say this, websites, if you go to a minerals company website, if they have one, is usually very inaccurate on what they're actually doing because I just spend my entire day chatting with folks on their strategy. And even from March to today, just the different counties they focus on or the the shift in strategy, entering new basins, it's it's important to stay on top of. And it, it it's definitely a, an evolving, moving target, right? You know, I, I think definitely got more competitive. You can speak to that, right, Matt? You acquire minerals. There's more players in the space now 
I, I think the broker model is going to be challenged a bit as markets get more efficient. But you know, I was just speaking with someone this morning, and they were talking about private equity portfolios starting to shake loose some some small parts to to window dress the portfolios a little bit. So the opportunities that present themselves are always uh, presenting themselves in different ways. Um, and it's not the same all the time. So you got to keep on top of what everyone's doing, stay plugged in and, and, and be ready to you know capture the value where it may present itself. Absolutely. When it's an ever-changing thing day to day, especially in the oil and gas world, and you've been kind of touching on it here, but we'll dive into the nitty gritty. How have you seen the mineral and royalty space change over the last one to two years? Have you heard of the types of buyers changing that are doing the deals? For us, I know Matt and I have discussed that there seems to be a, a big exodus in the middleman and mineral brokers, like you mentioned, who were active up until about a year ago. And more so, it's the in buyers remaining. Is that kind of what you're hearing and seeing as well? Yeah. So I think the brokers that there's still room for brokers, right? But you have to be sophisticated. I think you have to be, be able to understand how to aggregate deals that make sense for the end buyers. There's an increased importance to understand where they buy, what their underwriting criteria are. And when you generate deal flow, you can feed that to them. And that cuts down on due diligence. And you know you can get the repeat business type of, of relationship going, right? So that that's number one. The Two, the folks that are in there that were kind of putting a bad name on the space and driving values up, they're going to get squeezed out either by bad reputation or they just don't have their own money and they get caught holding the bag, right? In the musical chairs analogy, the music stops and they're not sitting down. They they lose a bunch of money and unfortunately have to exit. So we saw that at, at scale in the Anadarko Basin. I think you're starting to see that in the Permian a bit. Yeah, I think there's always going to be room for the smaller funds, maybe shorter life family office or high net worth money that can aggregate on the ground. And, you know, it could even be something as small as 100 NRAs, right? Collect 100 NRAs, you have the ability to sit on it for, you know, one or two years. So you're not completely exposed to the hamster wheel of deal flow and then can can exit it to the right end buyer. Again, having a sophistication on doing technical work in-house, getting the assets that make sense for your end buying market. So that's number one. I think there, there's always going to be a, a, a need for that that food chain, if you may, or the value chain. In terms of the end buyers, it, it's interesting. I see more and more folks trying to raise money direct from family offices and high net worth. Raising money direct from institutions is easier said than done. I think you have to have the track record to be able to raise that money from institutions, you know, i.e. endowments or foundations or insurance companies. That whether you have the credibility and the track record as a money manager or being with a, another financial institution, you have those connections already. I think, I think it's tough. I think it's a longer process and there's a lot of ed education needed. I see a lot more success on the family office side. And so the sweet spot on these small direct funds to, seems to be kind of 10 to 20 million is where people tap out, you know, maybe getting upwards of 50. I think the days of, you know, I want to deploy a couple hundred million dollars and get a private equity sponsor and get as big as I possibly can. I, I think that's going to become more selective. There's a lot of scrutiny on private equity is the wrong cost of capital out there for the mineral space. There's good arguments on both sides of that camp. I, I just think it needs to be constructed and executed the right way. I think we'll take a step back. When you look at a private equity sponsor, they have a portfolio of companies. They have this incredible pool of data. As a mineral port co of a PE sponsor, you get access to really potentially chase all those rigs within that portfolio, access to all that data. I think that's one of the main advantages of private equity. And then, of course, you can get the larger commitments to put dollars to work at scale. But the private equity model has largely been focused on buying undeveloped, buying ahead of the bid, assembling large technical teams to figure out all the variables at play to try to guess development timing as, as good as possible and, and be speculative from that respect to hopefully get those undeveloped assets into cash flow so that they can be exited at some point to uh, you know, a more yield code type firm that needs the distributions like a pension, like 
like a public company. In this environment, it's really hard to underwrite undeveloped acreage at, at scale. I think everyone's retreating to the core of the core in basins. Uh, I think people only want to underwrite ducks and you know permits that there's a lot of concrete evidence that there's going to be development. And just in general, when you kind of extrapolate things out a couple of years, I think rig activity is just generally going to slow down. Rig activity will rebound a bit, but it's going to be far less than in, in past years. And so as a result, I just think it's harder to put tons of dollars to work in the undeveloped space. People start shifting more and more to PDP buying. And that's, there's a lot of chatter around, around that out there. Oh, we're going to try to buy more PDP, but it's really difficult to deploy dollars at scale around just PDP. And so that's where I think the PE model's challenge is how do you put $100 million to work effectively? And, and I think the, the answer to that is less so on the organic side, more so on override carve outs or partnerships with EMP companies. I think on the back of the restructuring uh, of, of the downturn we're going in right now and the limited financing options that are out there for EMP companies, royalty financing, if, if you want to call it that, becomes a really viable option. Uh, I want to say it's probably a little cheaper than MES, um, a little more expensive, expensive than traditional bank debt or commercial debt. And as a result, it's one of the only, you know, games in town. And so you have to start looking at that. So you see the Antero override deal um, recently happened for 400 plus million. I think things like that will be where private equity starts to play. Pegasus just bought some assets from Blackstone Minerals, which is interesting. You haven't really seen any public minerals companies sell anything to date, but they were doing that to fix up the balance sheet a bit and you know, lower their debt. So I think private equity has a role to play to help as a be a financing option. And if you do things at scale and, and you run the numbers, you can make it work. And I think that's a dynamic I see shifting here going forward is that's where a lot of the dollars are going to be spent. I mean, you look at um, Carl Brensicki who sold Haymaker to Kimball, his new mandate with Denim Capital is to try to do one big chunky deal of a hundred plus million. So, you know, that's, I, I think, where there's, there's going to be a lot of appetite. But listen, there's still plenty of guys out there that are trying to roll up and aggregate different portfolios. And in theory, you're going to have a lot of guys that need to start selling down their portfolios or diluting them because you know the cash flows have, have started to dwindle a bit. Development activity is slower than they had projected and they need some near-term liquidity. They could be getting pressure from their investors to get liquidity near term than, than waiting for things to recover. And yeah, as a result, they need to, you know, start bringing assets to market. The other side of that argument is, well, there's, there's no cost on, on uh, these assets. And instead of if, if activity is going to slow, why don't we just dissolve the management team or roll up the portfolios and, and lower the GNA burn and we can just harvest the assets out. I think, you really just got to look at the specifics of how the portfolio was constructed and the cost of capital. Use an example from an episode I just did with Scott Noble. He said, if you're getting a three to five percent return over the next three years and your cost of capital is eight to nine percent, you're you're in a tough spot. And so you it probably makes more sense to to liquidate today before things get slower and and drag out a little bit more, where you know you're going to have to possibly sell at a larger discount in two years. And you also have that cost burn um, added up from two years. Makes more sense to maybe rationalize the portfolio, reset, and then you can come back to market with a different strategy, maybe a different cost of capital and, and capture the opportunities that are available right now because of COVID and the oil price war. So I, I just think the landscape of the types of opportunities and how they present themselves shift a little bit. It's going to be all the same players just retooling how they attack the market. No, absolutely. And I think that coincides with exactly what we've been seeing as well. You know, the, there's a lot of focus on shoring up that balance sheet and, and trying to do everything they can there. And you've kind of mentioned this a little bit, but the strategy shift that's occurring, and I know this is going to be individual to the oil company as well and what their strategy is, but are you seeing um, much more of a buy and hold mindset versus the buy and flip from a few months ago? Or is it just really dependent on the, that company's strategy? It's dependent on the investors. 
you know, if, if someone's buying PVP more times than not, they're, they're buying and hold forever. But yeah, if, if you can put together a strategy and a cap stack that enables you to take on more risk and buy undeveloped, I think scale matters. So if you're smaller, you might be able to take on a little bit more risk and, and then your pool of potential end buyers is larger when you're talking about building something up to $500,000 level or a million dollar level. There's a lot of potential buyers there. But I think when it comes to buy and hold forever, there, there's the pensions and some family offices that definitely stick to that mantra. But there's a lot of others who are saying, we're structuring our funds to where we don't have to exit to hit our hurdle rates, but we'll look at it opportunistically, kind of going back to the cornerstone example that I gave. So that's, that's definitely a shift. I think before everyone was getting drunk on these big returns um, off of the capital gain of an exit. And that market isn't fully developed, right? I mean, outside of the publics and a few really large end buyers, a couple hundred million dollar plus portfolio, there's not a, a whole lot of buyers there. And so there's a lot of speculation on kind of going back to what our clients always tell us. Hey, if you know of any new insurance companies or foundations or pensions or endowments that want to buy direct, let us know, you know, we got this great portfolio. It'd be awesome. It's cash flowing $30 million a year, or we have 30,000 NRA, whatever it is, whatever the stats are. I think you have to engineer your strategy and your portfolio to start distributing a cash and returns back to your investors along the way. And then if the market presents an opportunity to exit, then, then you get a, an extra bump in, in the return for everybody. But again, referencing this episode I just did with Scott Noble, he was just saying he thinks the world we live in going forward is you cash flow about 30, 40% of your returns. And then, you know, you wait for, for something in the market to happen and, you know, you get another, you know, 40 points maybe on the, uh, on an exit or something like that. And it's a 1.8, a, 1 1.8 to 2X return, whereas everyone's been trying to get north of 2X. It, Heath said the margin is going to shrink a little bit. Um, it's not going to be as easy to make a killing as it was before, but there's still money to be made. You just have to, I, I think the last men standing, less women and men, I should say, standing are the ones who are sophisticated, have technical backgrounds, have experience, maybe have the scale of, of, of capital to capture certain economies of scale opportunities like the override carve outs, uh, so on and so forth. No, sure. And, you know, you mentioned the opportunity to buy minerals while prices are low. You know, is it similar to the way that things were in 2015 or are investors being more cautious this time around, even though we've got low prices? It's, it's hard to compare downturns apples to apples. In all the conversations we have, taking a, a broader step back on the oil and gas side for EMP and midstream and services, all the distressed investors and the credit funds and the quote unquote rescue capital that, that's out there. It's not the same. Just, I mean, we've never experienced anything like this, right? COVID is so bizarre, the demand destruction that we've experienced and the demand supply balance of energy globally is, is quite unique, layered on top of the, the impact on the economy and people losing jobs, layered on top of the oil price war. So all those things combined make it extremely unique. In terms of the opportunities that will present itself, it's still too early, right? I think it's pretty common that in the beginning of a downturn, if you have cash, everyone's getting super excited and you know it's going to be there's going to be crazy opportunities just on low hanging fruit everywhere, but there's always a bit of spread because I think on the corporate side where you have sophistication of the financial markets and the industry at large and the trends and how they all fit together. I think that understanding there's a bit of a lag there at the individual mineral owner level. Uh, at least that's my opinion. And then they also get their check stubs on a two month delay on average. So if oil prices go down to what they were negative, is that April? I'm trying to remember the exact time frame. They don't experience that, you know, negative pricing revenue as it relates to royalty checks until June, July. So that lag plays into the opportunities kind of shaking loose. I think just extended periods of pain, you know, it, it's, well, my check's lower this month and 
the last few months, but it'll bounce back after it doesn't bounce back for six months and economists and, you know, all the analysts out there are able to really wrap their heads around how things are going to shake out because companies are starting to put out press releases and new OPEX and CAPEX budgets and all that stuff. I, I, I just think that takes time. And so we're what, six months into this deals are, I've been tough to, to transact on uh, Matt, you can probably speak to that directly. I know on all the conversations I've had, people are getting deals done, but it's at a much slower pace because some buyers are holding out. And I think from basin to basin, it changes. Uh, we have a bunch of webinars coming up on the mineral space to address that very topic, right? Or are the bid ask dynamics different basin to basin? I think, I think they are. I think when you look at what an NRA goes for from one basin to the other, the, the amount is quite different in the Permian versus the Bakken versus the Hainesville, right? And so when you're discounting something, just take a theoretical example, 20% based on all the dynamics that are happening in the market right now, 20% of 20,000 NRA is a much bigger write down than 20% of 6,000 NRA. And so I think a motivated seller is more willing to take that haircut and sell at a discount in, in the basins where the price points are lower than in basins where the price points are a bit higher, like the Permian. That's feedback I've heard, which is interesting. So the underwriting parameters are the same because the cost of capital is pretty much the same for all these shops who are active everywhere, but deals are getting done because of that in other areas and more rapid clip than somewhere like the Permian. And then just somewhere like the Permian as well, a lot of the rigs that were active in the country were based in the Permian. So you had incredible multiples being paid for undeveloped acreage and sellers still expect something similar to that. And even though oil has been around 40 bucks for the last few months, so there's some somewhat of stability there, there's still no visibility or increased visibility in comparison to March on when folks are going to start drilling again and what development is going to look like. And as a result, you can't underwrite undeveloped acreage with a whole lot of uh, certainty. And so the bid-ask spread on un undeveloped stuff is, is the same or, or very similar. And so that that's a challenge. So I think, you know, from what I hear from our service clients and our EMP clients is that September, October is a time frame that drilling is expected to pick back up again. And so for the dynamics I just described, there's a little more visibility on, on drilling activity and when, you know, ducks are going to come online and when permits are going to, you know, convert into drilling activity, I think you're going to start to see people be able to underwrite more aggressively and deals start to shake loose. And so that's kind of the general consensus I've made off of conversations is there will be incredible opportunities. You just, uh, we just need to wait a bit. And then to be determined is how everything looks in the corporate side of the world as restructuring processes get more mature. Will there be more override car routes? Will there be minerals portfolios that start to sell down? And I've already just started to see that a little bit. So those are the types of opportunities that might come to market in a chunkier way, latter part of this year, Q1 2021 as well. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that there's some folks out there that are concerned, you know, around what the market's going to look like and, and sort of what the landscape is going to look like with operator consolidations. And, you know, one of the things that have been discussed in the news and stuff like that is around stranded reserves. And, you know, our company is actually going to go back and, and drill that acreage. You know, are these concerns that you're also hearing from these mineral executives that you've had on the show or that you've worked with, just kind of waiting to see how the the industry shakes out and then whether they're going to start to go back and drill where people, you know, think they're going to go drill. Is, is that kind of the, the sentiment? So I, I highly encourage it's, it's one of the, the best episodes we've done. Most highly viewed episodes is the episode with Adam Watrous. He was the, the longtime banking head for natural resources for Scotia Watchers. And before that ran his own uh, A&D shop called Watchers and Co. to Calgary. He runs a private equity firm now. And I, uh, he doesn't invest in minerals, but he's such a, a thoughtful guy when it comes to trends and, and connecting the dots and, and seeing how the market dynamics play out. 
I, I put his episode on the Minerals podcast. We also have it on our investor podcast. But he called for peak Permian in January. So before COVID happened and the oil price war happened, he basically came out and said, the IEA is wrong. We're not going to 15 million barrels a day. We need to go backwards. Like direct quote from him was, the last five years in shale was the worst failed economic experiment uh, since the Soviet Union. He said capital was just incinerated. And, you know, you kind of see that sentiment right now with a lot of generalists leaving the space who haven't really made any returns. When oil went from 100 to 50, the marginal wedge of production increase from 2015 to today versus 2010 to 2015 was larger at half the oil price. And this, the messaging from the market was, well, we're just so much more efficient. The technology is so good that we're as profitable or better even at half the oil price. And Adam just goes into detail saying that just absolutely wasn't the case. And it was all getting rewarded on growth, not on profitability and the, the music stopping. And there's going to be a ton of people who lose money. And he, he was saying core of core assets, tier one assets, however you want to categorize that. It's all in the eye of the beholder, but I think we all get to the same destination at the end of the day on what types of assets those are. He goes, those will continue to get drilled. They'll continue to be traded at premiums in the M&A market. But the tier two and tier three assets, kind of what you're referring to, Matt, those will go on blowdown. He said there won't even be a bid for them, which is, which is a change from historical M&A cycles where you could always buy stuff at a discount if it was discounted enough. And the, the fundamental change that he kind of describes being an M&A guy is that the technological innovation that fracking brought into the space and horizontal drilling and, and all the different technologies around that unlocked so many reserves that companies went from reserves poor to reserves rich and drilling location poor to drilling location rich overnight. So he said, typically you would have a year or two's worth of it, drilling inventory and it was so much harder to discover oil than it was to buy it. And so you always had during downturns, people buying on the dip, buying additional reserves and drilling locations, buying additional production, because it was easier and cheaper to do that than kind of wildcatting it yourself, if you may. Because now kind of post shale evolution, people have 30 years of drilling inventory. They, they have more inventory than they could possibly drill up. I mean, you look at some, some companies in the Permian, they would need, uh, and I'm kind of making up the example, but just to give the gist of it, $50 billion to develop the, the portfolio and their market caps, 5 billion. I mean, that math doesn't add up, right? So what, what he described is in 2015, where everyone in the previous downturn, there's a frenzy of M&A activity buying stuff at discount. You didn't really see that as much. And that's because there's a structural shift in the buying demand, and that's gonna happen again. And, and he just says, the ones who have strong balance sheets and great operating teams, they're gonna cherry pick the tier one assets, and they're gonna say, you know what, we already have enough inventory, why do we need, even if it's pennies on the dollar, why do we need these additional tier two, tier three assets that aren't economic at sub $60 a barrel? We just don't need them. We have more than we can handle at the tier one level. And we just wanna make sure anything we add really makes an impact in the bottom line immediately. So I think if you bought minerals under tier two, tier three assets, you're in a tough spot right now. And another great episode was Chris Beato from Rocking WW Minerals. And he goes into that in great detail. And he, he, he's not a pessimist. You know, he's in the mineral space and building a portfolio like everyone else. But he was saying, you know, don't kid yourself. Billions of dollars have already been lost in the mineral space. He said, I think his analogy was the Titanic's going down and people think they're in the audience watching the movie, but they're really on the ship and they don't know it. And listen, uh, we'll see how things play out. I think where EMP companies that get mismanaged or over levered, they have all sorts of external pressures, right? They need to continue drilling to keep their production curves from declining too much. They need to reinvest capital. They, they have to service debt, all sorts of certain difficult things that in a downturn, if you're not healthy, it exposes you very quickly. In a mineral space, you don't have debt. You're not, you don't have any exposure to costs. And I feel like, or I wonder to myself, 
do people understand how incorrectly they bought if they did? I'm not, you know, accusing anyone right now, but there are people who, who didn't buy correctly and aren't going to make out well financially or going to lose money. Do they realize that in the same way an EMP company or a service company or a midstream company would? Or is there a delay there and now five to 10 years down the road that that kind of awakening happens in, in the financial markets after a bunch of money has been deployed? I think financial markets are dynamic and there's just some really smart people out there, but you saw what happened on the upstream side and, and the delays there. And minerals is, is relatively new to the institutional world. So we'll, we'll see who emerges as the winners and losers, but kind of a long-winded answer, Matt. I, I just think if you're not buying in, in really core areas, it's, it's tough justification to make. I, the only other strategy I've seen that I found interesting is if you're kind of having that royalty EMP symbiotic relationship strategy, you see with a lot of private equity companies like Mesa Minerals and Rockcliffe and the Haynesville, for instance, or Viper Diamondback. But, you know, at the private level, maybe on the conventional side, someone who's a super low cost operator, someone who has all sorts of technologies and ways to operate barrels at a very, very low cost. If you're buying ahead of their drill bit in those areas and they're able to justify uh, better returns and you have that line of sight to buy ahead of them or to buy in, you know, non-sexy areas and then you can buy it at a real good cost basis and this EMP company can then bring stuff back online and increase production. That may work, but that's kind of high level hypothetical, but I've heard of that and it's interesting to me. It's just, it goes back to scale of dollars. You know, how much money can you put to work on a strategy like that? And, you know, if, if it's a smaller fund and you have the right patience from your investor base could work. So we'll see, but uh, you'll see some creativity for sure. The, the industry is never short of that uh, and entrepreneurial spirit and, and all that jazz. Yeah. And I, and I think you're right. Tim, I think it's uh, it's interesting, you know, with the current prices at least, or with things maybe settling in around fifty dollars a barrel. I, I do agree that there is that uh, you know balance sheet crisis, so to speak, that we we're going through. That now it's uh, it's all about you know, are you drilling wells that are profitable versus just growing production, like was sort of the target in the past, like you mentioned. I, I really do think it's going to be interesting to see with the slowdown in drilling activity, how that's going to affect the supply demand, kind of the macro level, you know, are we going to see a, a huge, you know, fall off the cliff? I know we have a lot of drilled non-complete wells out there that could help uh, in the short term fill in that gap. But, you know, long term, if companies stop drilling, you know, are we going to see that fall off a cliff and then our price is going to go into to bounce back? And then are we going to learn the lesson to not repeat history again? Are we going to go back and these shale companies, are they going to drill wells that are profitable? And maybe it's tier two, but if you're at $75 a barrel oil, then maybe that's profitable then. But, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out for sure. Yeah. Listen, I mean, th there's a couple of comments on that. You know, one, will companies learn their lesson? Listen, if I, if I keep telling my wife, we need to run a better budget, but every time I go to swipe my credit card, it works. The best way to curb that behavior is if the credit card gets declined, right? So if the capital markets close off like they're going to, if you have tier two, tier three assets and you just can't get the money, you're going to go into blowdown and that production is going to fall off the, the national production uh, or supply curve over time. So that that's kind of one, just access to capital. I think in regards to you know rebound in pricing because the supply demand curve rebalances that that's definitely going to happen that's what a lot of investors talk about you know i think we're we're experiencing a lot of layoffs there is a bit of that dial up effect that shale wells have that you can bring on quite a bit of production in the shorter term uh, and so the us in a global macro perspective on their uh, portion of the the supply pie if you may will increase at larger prices. Uh, so where shale's economic above 60 bucks, it, if prices get above 60, I think US production becomes a larger percentage of, of global supply. Lower than 60 bucks, I think a lot of shale doesn't work. And you start to see some of these longer term 
conventional projects, you know, offshore, whatever, that the, the costs are baked in and the declines are very low. And they're, you know, you can't really turn those off and on in the same way you can a shale project. So I think U.S. production share goes down in a lower pricing environment. And I think that's probably the new happy medium that the U.S. plays going forward. I think the days of the U.S. is going to continue to grow like it's been growing and we're going to have 19 million barrels a day. The sentiment that I hear from our clients and my opinions are formed on what I hear, right? Uh, because we're talking with experts all day long. I don't see that happening. I, I think nine to 10 million barrels a day makes a lot of sense. We were at 12 to 13. So as soon as we get back to that point, prices will go back up again and they'll go back up because I think companies are going to be leaner. They won't be able to handle the demand to drill everything as quickly as the market may want. And so there's going to be a slow climb back there uh, and companies will be out of business. There might be not as much equipment available, all that stuff. So when it rebalances, hopefully there's more you know, fiscally responsible and operating behavior on behalf of the companies and can regain the trust of some investors. But there's always going to, if the returns are there, there's always going to be people who are willing to, to stomach some of that risk uh, and enter the play. I mean, I'll give it a perfect example of that we do uh, a lot of work in South America and Argentina has a, a terrible reputation from a national perspective of changing the rules, nationalizing assets, for, and this is, goes back to the beginning of the century. And with the Vaca Muerta Shale and the Macri uh, administration, pro-industry, pro-free markets, even with someone like Argentina, investors were starting to get comfortable uh, and singing the praise of Argentina. And then the administration changed, and then you have COVID and everything going on, and it, it's, it's, it's a super difficult market again. So the, the U.S. is not that cumbersome from a policy standpoint. And so I think as soon as the returns get attractive enough, again, the capital will fall back for sure. Yeah. And hopefully, like you've mentioned, you know, we do it in a more sustainable way this time. So a lot to think about. Sounds like there's a lot of opportunities that are still out there. If you're selective, uh, you know, I think that's going to be really interesting over the next year or two to see how things develop. And uh, we'll definitely encourage people to, to tune into your show to, uh, to stay on top of what's going on in the market. Any closing thoughts you want to share with our industry and investment community um, peers that are out there or with individual mineral owners? Yeah, I think more of a public service announcement, right? You know, for what you guys are doing on this podcast, Matt, and then and in ours, if you know of anyone who's interested in getting into the mineral space as an investor, you know, someone who's looking to sell, just anyone in between that spectrum, you know, uh, I hope that our content platforms can be shared to, to help educate them. And you guys are doing a fantastic job more at the, the mineral owner level. We're more at the corporate and financial markets level. And, and between the two of us, uh, you know, hopefully the word can be spread. And it, I think there's a lot of really good opportunities and more importantly, a lot of great people in the mineral space. And uh, I think the ultimate goal both of us are trying to achieve is just to help uh, expedite the the maturity of the space and, and help everyone out who's involved. So that would kind of be my closing message is just, if there's any way these platforms can be helpful, please spread that message um, into uh, your, your own personal circles. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And where can our listeners go to, to find your show? Yeah. So it's on, you know, all the different podcast channels that are out there. I think the simplest thing is just put, the Minerals and Royalties podcast, Oil Council, into Google, and, and you'll find it. Um, I think that's probably the simplest way. And uh, we also house everything on our website, oilcouncil.com. You can go to the, the webinar section, but you just Googling it will get you there. And uh, we you know announce every episode on LinkedIn and social and do email blasts to our network. But subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever it may be is the best way to stay up to tune with the new episodes, which we're doing about one every, every six days or so. 
That's great. And uh, how can folks go about getting in touch with you if they maybe want an introduction to one of your guests that's been on the show or if there's an opportunity they want to, to reach out about? Yeah, uh, my email is, is tim.powell, P-A-W-U-L, at oilcouncil.com. If anyone wants introductions, um, that's what we do. So it, it, whether it's a speaker on the podcast or, hey, Tim, have you heard about this minerals fund? I heard they're active in the Haynesville. You know, I, if I don't know them, it's very easy to reach out and develop a relationship and, and then make that intro. So you know, if you're looking to just build your network, if you're looking to meet with investors, if you're looking to potentially buy assets, sell assets, we can have a broad conversation around that and, and plug in the right people to help execute that strategy. Sounds good. And we'll link to all of the, uh, to his show and to email addresses and all that information in the show notes. So uh, you can find that at mineralrightspodcast.com and uh, just look for the episode with Tim Powell and uh, you can find it there. So thanks again, Tim, for your time. This has been uh, really helpful. No, thanks again, Matt and, and Justin. I enjoyed being on. It's fun to be on the other side of the table uh, <laughs> instead of doing the interviewing. So it's uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity and keep doing what you guys are doing and we'll do the same. And at the end of the day, hopefully we get more people transacting and you know help better everyone in the space. Sounds good. Thanks again. Thanks so much, Tim. Thanks so much for listening to the Mineral Rights Podcast with your host, Matt Sands. Don't forget to subscribe and share at mineralrightspodcast.com. The Mineral Rights Podcast should not be construed as investment, legal, or tax advice. All information is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy.